history and government discussions. I do these from time to time on a variety of topics, and I do them to try to help people to learn more about our wonderful nation and the incredible system of government that emanates from the unique constitution that we operate under. I hope you enjoy this presentation uh, and please come back and watch some more when you have an opportunity. I do post them to YouTube once they are completed and I've had a chance to edit them in a minor way at least. So I hope that you will be able to join us uh, very often. And so here, let's get underway for today. I think it's only fair to say that everybody loves a party and everybody loves a celebration. And in our culture, we have a goodly number of them that we observe, especially as we get towards the fall and into the winter season. So what we're gonna to do today is to take a look at this little question of celebrations. <laughs> And so we celebrate, many of us in many different ways. The first celebrations we generally attribute are the high holy days of the Jewish faith. The two main high holy days, also called the high holidays, include Rosh Hashanah or the New Year's celebration. It's one of the two New Year's celebrations of the Jewish faith, the other being Passover in the spring. The second high holiday is Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. And these generally come in September, October period uh, in the autumn. Kwanzaa is a new holiday. Uh, developed by a professor of Black Studies as recently as 1966. It's a Swahili phrase, uh, which means the first fruits of the harvest. It largely affects those people who are of African-American descent, uh, includes different symbols, unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith, and it's very helpful for the people in that faith. The Jewish people celebrate, of course, Hanukkah. Uh, this year, it's November 28th to December 6th. And there is the famous dreidel, a game that children play, but it's also a fascinating game with a great deal of symbolism that's part of it. And then they have the menorah with the many candles that are lit during the different periods. And it commemorates the rededication of the Holy Temple in the Second Temple in Jerusalem. It's observed for eight days and nights. And it's also known as the Festival of Lights and the Festival of Dedication. And uh, we see these different candles now being lit on different days with great symbolism in each one of them. There are eight branches with an additional visually distinct branch, the extra light, which uh, it's the others are lit is called. Then we have the role of the sun in our celebrations. People have for thousands of years, maybe tens of thousands of years, celebrated the astronomical markers that help them regulate things in their lives like agriculture. The solstices and equinoxes help people to know when to plant their seeds and harvest their crops. The winter solstice marks the day with the shortest period of daylight and the longest night. For the ancient Romans, the holiday was called Saturnalia, named for the god Saturn, celebrated by feasts, giving of gifts, a brief sense of equality through role reversal of the masters tending to be servants, begun maybe around 497 BC. Modern historians believe it probably started even earlier than that. And so for at least half a millennia after the origin of Saturnalia, Jesus Christ was born, his birth was not initially a holiday because birthdays were not then celebrated in the Jewish culture. And of course, Jesus was born into a Jewish world. It would be a few centuries until early church leaders decided it was a day to put on the calendar and commemorate. 
would also be a few centuries when they decided to pick a day for that celebration because the gospels do not tell us on what day Jesus was born. On December 25th, 274 AD, the emperor Aurelian consecrated the temple of Sol Invictus, creating a holiday called Dies Natalis Solus Invicti, the birthday of the sun, officially elevating the sun to the highest position among the gods, nudging a steering current, current towards monotheism. The Roman Catholic Church, around 350 AD, Pope Julius I officially declared December 25th to mark the birth of Christ. There was no evidence that says it was the actual day of birth. To the contrary, the Gospel of Luke says, and we quote, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Shepherds watch their flock by night during lambing season, which is in the spring. But there's no rule that says a day of celebration has to coincide with the actual date of origin. In Britain, for example, they celebrate the Queen's birthday on June 9th instead of her actual birthday, which is April 21st, because April showers bring May flowers. It's just a nicer time of the year. So in Rome in the fourth century, there were three big holidays celebrated on December 25th. Saturnalia, Dies, Dies Natalia Sol Invictus, and the Dies Natalis of the Christ. So conveniently, it's only natural the elements from these celebrations would cross-pollinate with each other, especially when they fit so well. For example, the gift giving of Saturnalia could be adopted by Christians as a symbolic of their God giving his only son to them as a gift on that day. As Rome faded and Christianity grew, the people that celebrated those holidays would take their traditions to new areas. As those early Christians moved into Northern Europe and introduced Christmas to the native Germanic peoples, the peoples, the peep practices of Christmas were influenced by the practices of those people that they observed with the winter solstice. Over time, traditions like the Yule log, mistletoe, tree decorating, and evergreen wreaths were absorbed and became thought of as Christmas traditions. The Saxons, the Vikings, the Victorians, and the capitalists have all added traditions to the rich tapestry of the holiday we all call Christmas. Got to say a word about St. Nicholas. The true story of Santa Claus begins with Nicholas, who was born during the third century in Greece, which is now Turkey. And his parents were very wealthy, and they raised him to be devout, and so that he should sell what he owned and give the money to the poor. And so he did that. And so he was known for his generosity and for his love for children. Under the Roman emperor Diocletian, he ruthlessly persecuted Christians and Bishop Nicholas suffered for his faith. And he was put in prison and so forth. And finally he was released and attended the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, which really forms much of what the modern Christian church observes. Uh, when he was buried, there was a unique relic called mana, which formed in his grave. And this liquid substance was said to have healing powers and so forth. So he's had a great influence. So, and so it was an outlawed holiday in some places. In early 17th century, a wave of religious reform changed the way Christmas was celebrated in Europe. Oliver Cromwell and his Puritans in 1645, vowed to rid England of decadence, and as part of their effort, they even canceled Christmas. When Charles II came to the throne, he restored Christmas, and he became a very popular king. The pilgrims, the English separatists that came to America in 1620, were even more orthodox than their Puritan beliefs uh, than Cromwell. As a result, Christmas was not a holiday in early America. From 1659 to 81, the celebration of Christmas was actually outlawed in Boston. Anyone celebrating Christmas was fined five shillings. Meanwhile, down in Virginia, they were having a more festive time. Uh, after the American Revolution, English customs fell out of favor, including Christmas. In fact, Christmas wasn't declared a federal holiday until June 26, 1870. 
So take a look at this dour looking dude. The question is, who is this? Who am I? Would you believe this is a depiction of Santa Claus in 1810? December 6th, 1810, John Petard commissioned artist Alexander Anderson to create the first known American image of Nicholas. And here are other versions of what St. Nicholas looked like, St. Nicholas of Myra. And of course, a more festive look. This is a Sinterklaas in the Netherlands in 2007. <clears throat> This is the more typical vision that we have of Santa today in the way we observe it. Uh, I love this cartoon. It says, he sees me when I'm sleeping. He knows when I'm awake. He knows what I've been bad or good. Lock him up for goodness sake. Uh, anyway, Santa Claus in the typical way we know him. Now, this is uh, Washington Irving who mentions St. Nicholas in his A History of New York in 1809. And again, in a sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, a gentleman in 1819. And so A Night Before Christmas was written by Clement Clark Moore or possibly Henry Livingston in 1822, although most think it was Clement Clark Moore. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midway to, to objects below. On what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver so lively and quick I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers, they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Dixon, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my hand and was herding around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. A stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth and the smoke had encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a brown little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Now, how did other artists depict him? 
Robert Waller Weir in 1838, who was influenced by Washington Irving's stories, envisioned him as an enigmatic trickster and a dispenser of holly, holly, holiday cheer. T.C. Boyd pictured him this way, a visit from St. Nicholas facsimile. This was in the St. Nicholas Center collection. Now note here, the dog-sized little reindeer. This was from 1848. This is F.O.C. Felix Octavius Gar, Carr Darley. His A Visit from St. Nicholas Image, a Gutenberg project from 1862. This is considered to be one of the first depictions of Santa Claus that was popular with the public. This is January 3rd, 1863 on Harper's Weekly by Thomas Mass, the cartoonist. And here you see Uncle Santa Claus has the stars and stripes for his uniform. He has a puppet that is on a string uh, actually being hung and guess who that is? That is the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis. You'll see that the soldiers are opening gifts and one of them has socks that he's receiving, which would have been a very welcome gift during the Civil War period. And you see, of course, the soldiers on their tents and in the field strung out across with the smoke and fire. You see the puppet down on the bottom jumping on Jack in the Box, uh, but this was very popular depiction of Santa Claus. Here is what the cover of that magazine actually looked like, Harper's Weekler, January 3rd, 1863. This is another depiction by Thomas Nass, and it shows the mother praying at the window with her two children tucked in bed, and the soldier alone at the fire in the field. On the four corners, you see in the upper left hand corner, Santa Claus getting in the chimney. And the lower left, you see the battlefield scenes and you see the saints and sea on the right. You see graves in the middle uh, of the depiction and you see Santa in the top or right uh, as he is departing in his sleigh. <clears throat> they try to depict everything in their cartoons during this period. This is also Christmas of 1863 by Thomas Naz. And you see the happy couple, he's home on leave in the middle with his children all around and mother and father in the background. Christmas morning on the right and Christmas Eve on the left. Uh, and it's just an interesting composition. Uh, you see the furlough dinner in the lower middle. Uh, and it's just a delightful depiction for Christmas in that period. This is December 31st, 1864. We only have a few more months of the war to go before it will actually end. And here Abraham Lincoln has set a great feast. Uh, and there are exactly the same number of empty seats at the table as there were states that had left the Union. Uh, and this is the Union Christmas dinner and the other sub little pieces of it in the different corners of the design. Here is 1865, another depiction with, uh, by again, Thomas Nast is drawing a lot of pictures during this period. And you see the very classic ways it's depicted. <clears throat> another Thomas Nast, we believe this is the first red suit depiction from 1869, very fat Santa in this case. This is a later 1890 color version of St. Nick, also by Thomas Nast. Here are other various illustrations by Thomas Nast, uh, 1869. Uh, and you see how the children are depicted and Santa getting up on the chimney and the, and the reindeer, all eight of them pulling the sleigh. Uh, this is Santa Claus mail, December 30th, 1871. And here you see the bad children in the picture in the upper left and the good children in the upper right. And you see the picture of letters from naughty children and the letters from children who are good. Santa's reading them all. This is 1871. And this is a color, colorized version of the same picture. <clears throat> 
It was 1874, Christmas Eve, Santa Claus waiting for the children to go to sleep. Uh, it's a hand-colored wood engraving. So Santa on top of the chimney with a loaded sleigh uh, and from the cover of the January 3rd Harper's Weekly. Uh, this is one that's kind of cute where the little boy is peeking around the corner uh, to see what Santa is up to uh, in 1876. Again, uh, this is the colorized version of it, uh, playing hide and seek as Santa, Santa starting his descent down the chimney. Uh, this one is again, another depiction was the night before Christmas. Uh, this little boy is standing on the bear's head rug uh, and uh, this is from December, 1876. This one, January 4th, 1878. You see the visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads and other things as the children are thinking about Christmas. And here's one, here we are again. Uh, this is January 5th, 1878. Uh, and it, is just interesting all the depictions they had of Santa in this period. This is Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night, Harper's Bazaar in January 4th, 1879. 1879, a Christmas post where the mail, a mailing letter to Santa uh, as her shaggy dog looks on. Here we have again, another depiction of Santa, January 4th, 1879. This is January 10th of 1880. The boy is stuck in his thumb. It pulled out a plum and he's about to eat it, a Christmas good boy. And here is Santa, merry old Santa Claus from 1881. And this one, remember the telephone had just been invented during this period. This is 1884, hello Santa Claus. Young girl telephoning Santa. And here's Santa saying, hello, little one. Hello, Santa Claus, 1884. Here we have 1885 with compliments of the season at Political Toy Bank. Uh, two hand engraved color engravings by Thomas Nass and an advertisement that's being performed. A beautiful hand colored wood engraving from 1885, and the two depictions under each one where Santa's pulling the bell rope is ding and dong. Thomas Nast, a Christmas box, this is 1885. Nast drew a lot of pictures during this period. Here are two little children looking at Santa's route in 1885. 1886 was the night before Christmas, and uh, here we see uh, two tiny, tiny mouse, mice rather, sound asleep in tiny beds on the mantel uh, next uh, to a holly wreath in a vase of mistletoe. And here we have another one, roughly in the same period. Caught in 1892. Here's one, Santa's got a box. It's uh, going to be delivered. This one's a different artist, Reginald Birch, 1906, in a publication called St. Nicholas for Young Folks. Here's E. Boyd Smith, Santa Claus, and all about him in 1908. Famous Norman Rockwell, Saturday Evening Post, December 2nd, 1922. Here is N.C. White, the great artist, Old Chris, the country gentleman, a print from 1925. J.C. Liondecker, Saturday Evening Post, 1925. This is the very first Haddon Sunbloom Coke Santa from 1931. He will depict Santa this way for 33 years. And it's just an interesting depiction. Many of our impressions of Santa come from Haddon Sundblom's characterizations. Here's Norman Rockwell, 1939, and how he was depicting Santa on the Saturday Evening Post. Here's a combination uh, from a publication called Roman Incorporated. 
And it, they've combined Nast Santa, Bishop Nicholas, the Coke Santa, an illustration put together by an artist, Rene Grafe. Here's Haddon Sunbloom from 1936, again, for Coca-Cola. Haddon Sunbloom from 1937. And from 1938. This 1941 version, the year I was born. Here he is in 1949. And in 1951. It was also famous around the world. Here is a German version from 1952. Here is his 1953. I always love this one where he has the little elves and all of the toys that they're painting and preparing. Here's 1955. In 1955 in Swedish. And in 1956. And this one in 1964 was the last Hatton Sunbloom characterization. And the one little oddity here is that the little poodle was actually a white poodle. But when Sunbloom was putting this together, he decided that in terms of visual characterization, it would look better black. So we changed the color of the dog. We all know about these stories. Uh, this one, we grew up with it. Uh, this one was from a 1939 promotion, a giveaway from Montgomery Ward department stores that were really big during that period. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It was uh, then transferred into lyrics and music and Gene Autry records it in 1949. And I dare you to go anywhere during the holiday season where you are not gonna hear Gene Autry singing this song. That was so successful that they took Frosty the Snowman, another book written in this period, and in 1950, that too is made into a song which we all know so well. Frosty the Snowman. Now, I will say that if I were making this presentation in person, I would actually have these songs playing, but because they will not be permitted on YouTube, I am not airing the songs right now. So you're going to have to use them in your own head, but you know them as well as anyone does. And of course, the famous Grinch who stole Christmas by the famous Dr. Seuss, Charlie Brown's Christmas. And famously, the story uh, written in the mid 1900s, uh, A Christmas Carol uh, by Charles Dickens which has been portrayed in movies many, many different ways. One of my favorite versions is the one by George C. Scott, and you see it pictured on the left, but they are all good. This is one person's list of the top 20 Christmas movies, and there are always new ones coming out every year, but most of them are only one-shot things. These sustain, and they're around year in, year in, and year out, although some towards the bottom, not quite so often. And famous Jingle Bells, a song that was composed in 1857 by Benjamin Hanby. He also writes Up on the Rooftop in 1864. Santa Claus is Coming to Town is considered by many to be the first modern holiday song. And that one too, we know by heart. In 1944, Judy Garland sings the song uh, have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas in Meet Me in St. Louis. And I sometimes have the video included, but I can't show that here today. Of course, we're forgetting sacred music, are we not? Uh, this is fundamentally a religious holiday. And so there are certain religious songs that get played and they should, and they are very meaningful uh, to most of us, especially from our childhood but these all have a story to tell, and they do. Silent Night is one of the oldest of them. It goes back to 1816. Hark the Herald Angels Sing is even older, composed in 1739 by Charles Wesley, the brother of John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism. Deck the Halls was a 1962 song published in Welsh Melodies. Uh, and 
uh, lines like, fill the mead cup, drain the barrel, had been swapped for Don We Now Our Gay Apparel. Uh, this variant became popular from revised music sheet print pinching, printings made in 1877 and 1881. And then we all, this is sort of a, a fun one, in 1944, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Good King Wenceslas goes back to 1853. A real man ruled from 924 to 935 when he was assassinated by his own brother. Uh, o Tannenbaum, the carol comes from Germany. The earliest version of the song dates back to the 16th century. O Little Town of Bethlehem, Philip Brooks, best known for penning this song. In 1865, Brooks rode on horseback from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, where he participated in the Church of Nativity's five hour long Christmas Eve celebration. This very famous song, I'll Be Home for Christmas from 1943, a top 10 hit, originally written to honor soldiers overseas who longed to be home for Christmas, and it became a standard which we all hear again and again. We wish you a Merry Christmas. And that really is the end of this uh, presentation. And I thank you for listening and watching. And I hope that it helped you to understand Christmas today a little bit. Now I'm going to add on these pictures for my own benefit. Um, one of the things that greatly influenced me were these paintings by George Hinckley. Uh, when I was a little boy, a distant relative sent this book called a Christmas book called Christmas Ideals every year for several years. And George Hinckley had his artist repair, uh, included in those uh, publications. And these are the ones that I saw as a little boy and they greatly influenced my uh, fantasies about Santa Claus and the North Pole and what the elves looked like and so forth. And so I'm just going to thumb through these. I would pour over these. I would watch these for hours. I would go back to them and I would just find them so engaging to me. And they shaped my Santa Claus in my mind. This along with the Haddon Sunbloom ones and Coca-Cola, of course. Uh, and it was just you know, a very happy, beautiful Santa, uh, very mystical. And it was a time when I was in fact a true believer and uh, I just knew this was how Santa and uh, Santa Claus really was. Uh, and so I just wanted to quickly share these with you. Uh, it's a fabulous publication, no longer published uh, in the same way, uh, but uh, was delightful. So sharing that. And with that, I in fact wish you all kinds of love and a truly Merry Christmas and a fabulous new year and lives that are beyond anything you can imagine.